Parents, welcome to another week of Kids Church at Home. It's me, um, uh, Jonathan. That's it, Chawu. Uh, that's it. I uh, hope you're having a great week. Uh, it is, uh, I know school is almost starting. Uh, I would love to uh, to know what you're doing at school. I know some kids are um, going uh, to school in person. Some people are doing it online. Some people are doing it at home. And uh, I know I've talked to some of you. You're just not doing it this year. I get it. Uh, I'm not either, uh, mainly because I'm old. Uh, anyway, uh, but we have a great, uh, a great kids' church at home today. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, another miracle that Jesus performed where he fed the 5,000. Uh, but we do have something very special we want to tell you about. Uh, we have a friend. Her name is Winter. And Winter has been watching Kids' Church at Home uh, every day or every Sunday. And she lives in uh, Virginia and a uh, good friend of mine. And Winter... We uh, wanted to wish you a very special birthday this week. We have a very special birthday video for you from a friend. Uh, let's go ahead and hit that video. Do what? The, the video is not working? Yeah, but it's her birthday. <laughs> uh, Winter, um, I'm really sorry uh, that we couldn't uh, play you a special birthday what? video. Did you hear that? I could... Squeak! I could have sworn I heard squeak. Anyway. Well, Winter, we hope that you have an incredible... Squeak! Squeak! Hey! Squeak! 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 <laughs> squeak! Where? Squeak! Squeak! Ah, ah, I got him! I got him! I got him! <laughs> hey, what's up, buddy? Ah, you bit me! Whew. Uh, squeak! Uh, listen, while I've got you here, are you okay? Squeak! It's okay. Be calm. Be calm, buddy. Uh, it's okay. He's a little trembly. Uh, uh, squeak! It is my friend Winter's birthday. Uh, do you know Winter? Squeak! Uh, sure. Uh, can you sing Happy Birthday to Winter f with me? Uh, I'll take that as a yes. All right. Uh, are you ready? Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, here we go. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear winter. Happy birthday to... Okay, all right. Turn it off, buddy. Turn it off, buddy. All right. Uh, have, you, have a great week. Uh, and, um, oh, I probably need to take him out. Uh, Squeep, uh, let's, uh, let's get you back in your cage, okay? How did you get out? Squeep. Okay. Ah, where did you go? Uh, here are the kids' church rules. We'll be back in just a second. <laughs> We have to know that uh, Squeep has been returned uh, to his cell. Um, it's a very strange place. He's okay, but winter, happy birthday. Um, we do have a couple of announcements before we get into our lesson. We want to let you know a couple of things. First of all, we are so excited to start Kingdom Kids. Kingdom Kids is our kids' choir that we do every week, and we put on a Christmas musical in December, appropriately, and uh, we put on a spring uh, musical in uh, <clears throat> the spring. Uh, and so we're going to be doing a very unique kids musical this year for Christmas. And I am so excited about it. I've spent the last few weeks kind of writing and coming up with crazy and creative and fun ideas that we want you to be a part of. Uh, and so if you would like to be a part of Kingdom Kids, uh, all you need to do is go to our church's website and go to our kids ministry page. You can sign up there and join in the fun. The, the neat thing is, is that we're not actually doing practices in person. Uh, you'll be practicing at home. We'll put up videos just like this Kids Church at Home video of the songs that you can learn. We'll be sending out scripts of some of the things that you'll need to know. Uh, and so the cool thing is that you'll just do a lot of the of the musical by videotaping yourself saying something or singing a song and then sending it in. And I'll do all the work of kind of putting it 
together. So wherever you are, even if you're not in Birmingham and you're not in, you know, normally part of our church, you're actually, we would love for you to be a part of our Kingdom Kids musical. It'd be kind of fun to have friends who normally wouldn't be able to be a part of it. Even though we're kind of all distance, we can actually do it all together kind of uniquely. So if you'd like to be a part of it, you can go to our website at our church, smcc.church, and join there. Also, our Wednesday night Bible memory program uh, called Adventure Crew, our brand new program that we started last year. We're beginning that as well. We're sending the, the first new book home at the end of the month, and we'll start the first Wednesday in September. If you would like to be a part of that, we want you to sign up. You can go to our website and sign up there. we got a brand new book as we're learning what it means to walk the path of righteousness, and uh, we have exciting things in store for you as well. And then also the big thing, our drive through adventure, our church-wide, city-wide scavenger hunt where everyone gets to be a part of it. And even if you're not in our own city, you can still be a part of it. A lot of the missions you can do anywhere. Now, there's some things that you have to be in Birmingham to do. You can just you just don't have to do those missions. You can do other ones, but it's going to be so much fun. It's going to be an absolute blast as you're um, driving around, doing fun things, taking pictures, videos with your family, and also watching along with all the other people who are doing it as well on the little feed. Uh, if you want to find more information about it, you can go to our church's website and download the app and sign up today. We've got a handful of teams already ready to go. This is the perfect thing to do with your family on a Saturday morning, August the 29th from 9 to 12, a big church-wide competition. We don't want you to miss out on it. Well, we want to get into our kids' church lesson, and the first thing we want to do is we want to ask our big question. And our big question is this, why did Jesus perform miracles. You know, last week we looked at Jesus calming the storm. He calmed the wind and the waves, and it showed that he was God. He did this miracle so that clearly the only person that can make creation obey would be the creator. People cannot stop the wind and the waves. People do not control the weather. We can predict the weather. We can forecast it. We can try and protect ourselves from it with an umbrella, but the weather's coming whether we like it or not. And yet, when Jesus performed this miracle, he showed who he really was. He was God. Well, today we're going to look at another miracle that Jesus performed. And he's going to perform it for another reason. Where obviously, any miracle he performed shows that he was God. But today, the miracle is going to show that not only is he a God who's all-powerful, he's also a God who really does care. Um, so, what I want to show you is a little bit of what uh, Jesus did Jesus had been teaching, and all of these people um, were hungry that Jesus had been teaching. Uh, they had been following him. He had been healing the sick and, and the lame. Uh, and it got time for people to eat, and there was no food. And so uh, Jesus said, well, hey, maybe we should feed everyone. And they said, well, no, there's no way. That any, any, if we were going to feed all of these people, uh, you can imagine how much money that would cost. Could you imagine how much it would cost to take 5,000 people out to dinner? I mean, I know how much it costs to take six people out for dinner at my house, and it's not cheap. Can you imagine 5,000 people? And I mean, that's, that's like, can you imagine the drive through at Chick-fil-A that day? That's a long drive through right? That's, that's a lot of food for a lot of people. And, and the people were wondering, well, how in the world are we going to be able to feed uh, the, the people that are hungry? And so Jesus, who had been healing people and, and doing all these incredible things, he said, get all the people together. And, and a little boy brought his food that he had, his lunch, enough to feed him. Uh, I made little paper cutouts of them. He brought uh, two little uh, little fish here. And uh, not only did he have uh, two fish, he also had uh, five little uh, loaves of bread. See, I made a little, uh, kind, of, uh, kind of a little lopsided, but little slices of, uh, of bread. And Jesus had um, the disciples bring all of the bread uh, to him and all of the fish, and he said, "Well, have have everyone sit down, and 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 I'll 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 bless the food." And so Jesus had them bring all of the food together, and he blessed it, and he began to to feed the people, and he he had them pass food out, and he said, "Here, you can have some of the food," and he gave it to other people, and you can have some of the food, and uh, here you can have some food, and um, you can have some food, and he began to feed the people over and over. And over again until um, the people um, oh, hold on a second oh 
Oh my goodness. I, you know, I bet when the people saw Jesus feeding the food at first, they probably didn't think anything of it. But then after a while, they must have thought, how in the world did this man get this bread? He doesn't have a bakery around him anywhere. How in the world did he do this? I mean, that, that must have been a pretty cool thing to see Jesus do, right? Now, um, this is just a little trick. This is not a miracle. Uh, but what Jesus did was an incredible miracle. He performed this incredible act of of God. And so we want to take a look at our Bible story today and see exactly what Jesus did and what we can learn from it. Check this out. Jesus' disciples had been hard at work. They had been healing people and teaching them. So many people came and went that the disciples did not even have time to eat. So Jesus said to them, come with me. Let's go to a quiet place where we can be alone and get some rest. Jesus and his disciples got into a boat to cross the Sea of Galilee, but many people saw them leaving. The people traveled by foot and they ran ahead of Jesus. When Jesus and his disciples got to the shore, the people were already there waiting for them. Jesus saw the crowd and he cared about them because they were like sheep who needed a shepherd. So Jesus, taught the people many things about God's kingdom, and he healed people who were sick. By this time, it was late in the day. Jesus' disciples came to him and said, We are out in the middle of nowhere, and it's getting late. Tell the people to go away so they can go to the farms and villages to buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus said, They don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. Jesus' disciples were confused. We can't feed this many people, they said. It would cost a whole year's pay to buy enough bread for them to eat, Philip said. Jesus asked, how many loaves of bread do you have? Go look. Jesus' disciple Andrew said, a boy here has five loaves and two fish, but what good will that do for so many people? Jesus told the disciples, to instruct everyone to sit down. So all the people sat down in big groups on the grass. Jesus took the five loaves of bread and the two fish. He looked up to heaven and then he blessed the bread. He broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples. He also divided up the fish. The disciples passed out the food to the people and everyone ate until they were full. Then Jesus told the disciples to collect any leftover food. The disciples collected 12 baskets full of pieces of bread and fish. Jesus fed about 5,000 men that day, plus women and children. By feeding the 5,000, Jesus provided for the physical needs of the crowd. The next day, Jesus called himself the bread of life. Only Jesus is able to satisfy our souls forever by providing forgiveness, peace with God, and eternal life. You know, one of the really incredible things about this story, and when I say story, I'm talking about a true story. This is not a made-up story. This is not a parable. Uh, this is not a once-upon-a-time story. This is a it-really-happened story. And the the the... the the disciples who were writing and witnessing this and, and wrote it down in the Gospels, the ones that were disciples, they were writing down what they saw. They were writing down what happened. This is not a story about Jesus. This is the story of Jesus that's true. And in our Bible story today, what we see Jesus do is he performed a miracle. We see another side of him. You see, when Jesus was in the boat last week, as we saw, and he calmed the wind and the waves, the, the disciples marveled and wondered, who is this person? And the answer to that was God. This man clearly is God. And today, though the disciples would have been marveling as well, we see Jesus performing a miracle not just to prove that he was God, but we also see another reason why Jesus performed a miracle that shows the kind of God that he is. You see, all the people needed food because, well, they were hungry. They had a need. Have you ever been hungry? I'm 
I bet you are hungry all the time. I feel like I'm always hungry. By the time I get to dinner, it's like I'm about to eat something. I'm going to eat the dog or something. If, if I don't get food, I am starving. And the people were hungry. And Jesus performed a miracle. And he gave them food. Do you know why? Because they needed it. But Jesus also said something really fascinating. Not only did he give the people bread, but he also said that he was the bread of life. You know, I've been so hungry before. And you know how when you finally, like, you finally get to sit down and eat and the food is hot and it's your favorite meal and you just eat it and you're just so full and maybe there's dessert if it's extra special and you get to eat the dessert and your tummy is just stuffed. You know, like on Thanksgiving, when you've been at grandma's house for hours and hours and you're supposed to be eating lunch and now it's like two in the afternoon and you're like, good heavens, when are we eating? And even watching it be prepared and you're so hungry and you're starving and you're waiting to just dig into like the turkey and the mashed potatoes and the macaroni and cheese and then you fill your plate up and you're stuffed and then the whole lineup of pies come out and the pumpkin and the pecan pie and the weird person who brought brownies. and, and But you don't care because it's all good. And you're now eating all of this food and your stomach is so full. It feels good, doesn't it? Well, let me ask you a question. As good as that food was and as full as your stomach was, were you ever hungry again? You were hungry again. You know why? Because your food, it never fully satisfies you. It satisfies you in the moment. But I'm pretty sure in like five or six hours, you're probably going to want to eat again. Or if you have a big meal, by the time you wake up, you're probably going to be pretty hungry. And what Jesus was saying when he called himself the bread of life, what he was saying is, is that, listen, Jesus came not just to, to meet our physical needs, but Jesus also came to meet our greatest need, which is a spiritual need. He came to give us true life, life that comes from him. It's like when Jesus talked to the woman at the well and he told her, you know, if you if you ask me for water, I can give you living water so that you'll never thirst again. This woman had spent her whole life looking and searching for something that would satisfy her many husbands clearly never satisfied. And nothing in this earth would have. And now Jesus is feeding these people knowing, guess what? Even though I fed 5,000 people with 12 baskets of leftovers, these people are going to be hungry again. And yet what Jesus was saying was, is that if you give your life to me, the life that I will give you will be a life that is satisfied by me and I never stop satisfying. I am the bread of life. Jesus was talking about the salvation. He's talking about the gospel. He's saying, come to me and be satisfied in me. The bread that you eat will make you hungry again. To the woman at the well, the water you drink will make you thirsty again. But I will give you living water. I will give you the bread of life. Because true life, eternal life, comes from Christ. We're talking about bread. I don't know about you, but I'm pretty much ready for a sandwich, a slice of toast or something. But we want to talk about food a little bit more. Um, Now, in my house... We get lots of groceries. We started doing uh, delivered groceries uh, during the whole pandemic. And once our family got sick, we started having people bring groceries to our house. And we all always have food stocked at our house, more food that we can eat. Our freezer is full, our pantry is full, and our bellies are full. But you know what? There's a lot of people in our world that don't have the food that they need. There are people in our world who are, at times, hungry. People who live in poverty, which is meaning they don't have enough kids, who has families who don't have enough to feed them. One of the things that we do at our church is that we work with a ministry called the Christian Service Mission. We got to go this week with some of our pastors and some of the people from our church, and we pack up boxes full of food that we distribute to people in the community who don't have what they need. But what do we do about that? How should we feel about the people who don't have food? What, what is the right Christ-like way to think about that. Well, that's the exact question that we're going to look at in our questions from kids today. Check this out. Hi there, I'm Pastor Brian, and it's time for questions from kids. Autumn from Tulsa, Oklahoma asks, 
If Jesus meets our needs, why do some people not have enough to eat? Autumn, that's a fantastic question, a difficult one, because we know that God has promised to meet needs, but at times we see people who, you know, maybe are homeless or who are hungry, and we have to ask, how do these kind of align? Well, let me kind of answer this a little bit uh, because it's a really challenging one, but let me kind of speak to a couple ideas that are, are baked into this question. The first thing is this, we have to differentiate between what is a want and a need. I think sometimes that's kind of a problem that we assume that wants are actually needs and they're not. And God does not promise to give us our wants all the time, just our needs. So that's the first part. The second part is this, that we have to look at this over the, the long term. Um, there may be somebody who goes without a meal and is hungry, and we can say, well, God's not meeting that person's needs, right? But then God provides for that need the next day and they have food to eat. So you have to look at the longer term as well. Another aspect is this, that God has promised to meet needs and he chooses to use the church to meet a lot of those needs. So a lot of this, is this should cause us to care deeply about stepping in to other people's lives and recognizing there are people who are hungry in our towns. And God has given us resources to help meet those needs. Are we being faithful? Are we giving generously? Are we serving? Are we spending time helping um, at, at, a, a, at a soup kitchen, for example, that is there to help meet the needs of people who don't have money right now? And so there are a lot of things going on here in terms of those practical needs. But the bigger idea here, the, the idea that we can be a little bit more clear on is this. The greatest need we have is not food or a place to live. The greatest need we have is Jesus. And God has completely met that need by giving us Jesus to provide salvation for us when we trust in him. That is our greatest need, and that need is available for anyone who calls on him. And so we have to remember that as well. As we seek to meet the physical needs of people, the greater thing we need to do is make sure we are stepping in to share Christ so their greater spiritual need can be met. So here's a question back for you to consider. What needs will you trust Jesus to meet? You know, throughout our world, in, in other countries, but also in our, own, in our own cities, in our own neighborhoods, that there are people who do not have what they need. And one of the reasons that is, is because we live in a world that's broken by sin. You know, in the, in the, in the garden, Adam and Eve had everything that they needed. There was never a time where Adam was hungry and couldn't find some fruit. He, he could find it very easily because he lived in a world that provided for his needs. The world that God created was living in perfect harmony with man and creation, and God was a part of that as well. And sin, it broke all that apart. So now one of the curses of sin was Adam had to work for his food. The ground's not just going to freely give it up the way it had. And sin affected that. And so when we see people who, who don't have what they need, that's part of what our broken world is. And for us as Christians, for us as the church, we have a responsibility to help those people. That's part of what the church is, is that we are to care for those who don't have enough. You know, in the book of 1 John, the Apostle John, he talks about how uh, we must love in word and or in not just word, meaning we don't just tell people we love them, but we want to love people in truth and in deed, in deed and in truth. Loving people with the truth of God, but also helping to meet their needs as well. You know, if we see someone who has something and they are in need, right? Someone who has a need and we have what they need and we withhold it, that's not really love. And so one of the ways that we can show the world who God is, is by loving them when there is a need. One of the ways that we point other people to God is by loving people selflessly as the church. We serve them. We help give to them. We help provide their needs. Many of us don't just have enough to meet our needs. We have more than enough. And so we want to take the things that we have and we want to be giving those away. We want to use the things that God has given us to help meet the needs and to take care of those around us who don't have what we need. And by doing that, we bring glory and honor to God and we also end up showing other people what God is like that God is a loving God. And we see that Jesus met the physical needs of these people, but
but he was even more concerned with meeting their spiritual needs. Because though he might feed them for today, they will be hungry tomorrow. However, to, to receive eternal life is to receive life that never ends. Well, we're going to do some singing this morning, and we want to sing about our great God in Jesus Christ. And so we want to sing a song about Jesus where it says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And Jesus was this beautiful picture, this perfect reflection, this perfect living out of who God is and what he is like. And we want to rejoice and worship him this morning. We hope you'll sing with us. John 1.14 And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us And we have seen His glory Glory as of the only Son from the Father we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth. Yeah. And dwelt among us, and the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. Full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth, full of grace and truth. Oh. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth, 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 full of grace and truth. You know, our whole life is spent in almost as if we are running a race. And our race doesn't end until the day that our physical bodies die, when our time here on earth comes to an end. But right now we're running a race, and the races that we're run is to further the gospel, to bring glory and honor to God, and to grow to become more like Christ. That's what we're doing. That's why we are living and why we are living our life as a Christian, to bring glory and honor to Him. And we want to sing a song about that now. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead. I 
press on, I press on. for Argus's bad joke of the day. Argus, take it away. <laughs> and now it is time for the Sunday Showdown. Today we're going to play a game that's called Weird Facts About Animals. Here's what it's going to do. Here's how it works. I'm going to read you a fact about an animal. You have to decide whether this tr fact is true or it's not true. It might be true. It might be a fascinating, interesting fact about an animal or um, we just made it up. Those are your options. All right. So here is our First uh, fact about an animal. Here it is. Gorillas can catch human colds and other illnesses. Huh. Gorillas can catch diseases from people. That's interesting. Do you think that um, they're making the gorillas wear masks at the zoo? I don't know. I bet they don't keep them on. They're not very good at that. Anyway, uh, who knows? Is this true? Is this false? Let me know. Give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Can gorillas catch cold and other human illnesses from people? And the answer is, it is true. It's true. So please, don't go kissing any gorillas. We don't want to get those guys sick. But to be honest with you, uh, if you kiss a gorilla, I'm probably more afraid for you than for the gorilla because uh, they don't like to be kissed. Trust me. <laughs> that was a bad day at the zoo. All right, here is our next animal fact. I really like this one. If you lift a kangaroo's tail into the air, it cannot hop. So you sneak up behind a kangaroo in Australia, and you grab its tail and lift it up off the ground, it can't jump. <laughs> I think that's really funny. Or maybe it's not true. What a great way of, uh, you know, keeping a kangaroo from running away. Just lift his tail up in the air, and uh, he can't jump. Or maybe that's not true. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think it's true or false? Well, let's look at the answer, and it is true! It is actually true! Who knew? I did. Mm -hmm. All right, here is our next animal fact, and we're going over to an ostriches. 
Here's an ostrich uh, fact for you. Male ostriches can roar like lions. Uh, now, they don't look quite as threatening as a lion. Lions are like big and majestic and uh, ferocious. And uh, ostriches looks like if a snake and a bird had a baby. That's kind of what an ostrich looks like. It's just, anyway. Uh, but can they roar like male, like, can they roar like lions? That would be, can you imagine, like, instead of the Lion King, it's the Ostrich King? That's a weird movie. Anyway, true or false? And the answer is, it is true. It is true. So next time you're at the zoo and you hear a roar and you think, hey, that's a lion, it could also be an, uh, an ostrich. All right, here is our next one. Uh, this one is a lovely horse uh, for you. Horses can run faster than ostriches. Now, I've never raced an ostrich, but I know horses can run fast. Uh, that's a kind of a widely known fact. Uh, we, so we know horses are fast, but are they faster than ostriches? How fast do ostriches go? Who knows? Is it true horses are faster than ostriches? And the answer is false. The ostrich is faster. Well, then why have we not been riding ostriches this whole time? How come Ben Hur is not a bunch of ostriches pulling a bunch of chariots? How come you don't see cowboys out in the Wild West just holding on to... Anyway, that's neither here nor there. All right, here's the next one. Uh, ants never sleep. Oh, huh. they never sleep. I guess maybe because... But here's the real mystery. Ants live in something called ant beds. They live in an ant bed. If they don't sleep, then it's a waste of bed. They should call it something else, like an ant workplace or something like that. Or maybe it's a lie. I have no idea. Yes, I do. I do know. I looked. All right. Do you think it's true or false? Lock in your answer. And it is true. Can you imagine how miserable it would be to be an ant? You live your whole life in a bed and you can never sleep. Do you think it, do you, are they incapable of sleeping or they're just so busy they never get around to it? Or maybe one of them fell asleep on his back, never got up, and they're like, don't ever do that. That's how we go down. All right, here is our next animal fact. A group of owls is called a senate. And they live in Washington, D.C. No, uh, a group of owls is called a senate. It's a weird group. I know that there's lots of animal groupings that have weird names. Is a group of owls called a senate? And the answer is, it is false. It is actually called a parliament. It's called a parliament. Um, so that's kind of like a, like British government. So uh, you're close. Not the Senate. The parliament. All right. Here's our next one. We're going to the hummingbirds. Hummingbirds can fly backwards. And if that's true, guys, you're just showing off. You're making everyone else just feel like bad about themselves. Hummingbirds out there. Check this out. And all the other birds are like, hey, that's not fair. Anyway, or maybe it's not true. I've never ridden one, so I wouldn't know. Uh, can hummingbirds fly in reverse? You think, do they have like a rear view mirror? How do they like, how do they look behind them? They might fly backwards. Can you imagine a hummingbird flying backwards into your window? It would be a softest little pink. Uh, anyway, but it might be a lie. I don't really know. Here's the answer. And it is true. It is true. They can fly backwards, which is really cool. Can other things fly backwards? I think if a plane flew backwards, then you should probably jump out of that airplane. That's not good. You don't want that. Here is our next one. We're going to a peacocks. A female peacock are actually called a peahen. Huh, you got a peacock and a peahen. Is this true? Or is this just a fun little play on words? And the answer is, it is true. It is true. A lot of true facts. You never know when a false one's going to sneak in. That's the fun part. Here is our next one. It's a giraffe fact. Did you know that giraffes do not have vocal cords. That's right. That's why you will never see a giraffe sing. Ever. They're just destined to just or whatever they do, but you'll never, they can't talk. What about Madagascar? How did that one talk? Huh. Maybe Madagascar, that wasn't a real movie. Hmm. Or maybe they do have vocal cords. Let's hope they do. Because if not, that's an awful waste of a throat, isn't it? And boy, do they have a good one. Let's see the answer. And the answer is, it is true. Giraffes have no vocal cords. How do they sing? I feel like a giraffe choir would be just incredible. You know? Anyway, too bad. That's their problem. All right. Now we're going over to some tigers. 
Did you know that tigers have striped skin under their striped fur? That way, if you cut all their hair off, they still have the clothes on. They still got their stripes. Or not. I've never shaved a tiger, so I don't know that I would know this. And I don't know who found this fact out or not. But I bet that person maybe lost a limb. Because I can't imagine tigers really enjoying a nice haircut, a little trim. Especially a buzz cut, man. If you're finding out what their skin looks like, you're getting deep. This is not a trim. This is like a summer buzz. Um, they're getting sheared. Is it true or is it false? It is true. Deep down underneath, and you're just going to have to take our word for it. Don't find out for yourself, please. Their skin is striped. But to be honest, I can be lying because you'll never know. You'll never get close enough. Anyway, but it is true. Someone did. Uh, here is our next animal fact. And the animal fact is this. A six-foot anteater has a one-inch wide mouth. Can you imagine? Being that big in your mouth is just like a little... I mean, got to be honest, ants ants are crawling, and they're so tiny. You don't have to be open wide. It's not like, oh, here's a big ant, but open wide. You don't need a big mouth. And you know what? If you're an anteater, one of the nice things is, is that you can eat ants all the time. They're never sleeping. So it's like a 24-hour drive through They're never closed. They're always working. So anteater wants a little late-night snack. It's like, you know, oh, we're closed. No, you're not. You don't sleep. And I know exactly where to find you in your bed wide awake. Uh, anyway, here is our next fact. Oh, well, wait, did we find out if this is true or not? Let's find out if it's true. And the answer is, it is true. Weird. Tiny little mouth. Big guy, little mouth. All right. That's not me. All right. Here is our next animal fact. Did you know that the tongue of a blue whale is heavier than most elephants? Yuck. How did they get the tongue on a scale? What kind of scale does that look like? Can you imagine? Surely it wasn't like the one that you got in your bathroom. That would be kind of weird. Uh, how is, is the tongue of a blue whale the, how, the heavy, the weight of an elephant? Let's find out. And it is true. My goodness, we are really learning a lot of weird things. Uh, here is our next animal fact. And here it is. A single elephant tooth can weigh nine pounds. That's like, that's like a bowling ball. Can you imagine an elephant having like a whole row of like bowling ball heavy teeth? Uh, that's some chompers, man. Those are some pounders. Or maybe it's not true. I have no idea. Let's look out the answer, and the answer is it is true. It is true. <sighs> Holy moly. All right, here is our next one. This one is about pandas. Panda, panda. Did you know that a newborn panda is the size of a house cat? A little, little panda comes out looking a little, like a little cat. Meow, 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 meow. Eating a little bamboo. Or it's not true. Or it is. Who knows? The answer is, it is false! What? And that's right. A newborn panda is actually the size of a tiny mouse. Can you imagine that? how they, they come out this little tiny and they get that big? It's incredible. All right. Here is our next one. We got two more. The next one is this. Camels can drink up to 40 gallons of water at a time. That's all incredible. That's like filling up your gas can like you know, on your truck. That's a lot. 40 gallons. I mean, I guess they need it because they're not, you know, there's not a lot of gas stations to stop it, you know, to get a little refill in the desert when you're on a long road trip. Or that's not true. Is it true? Can they drink 40 gallons of water? And the answer is yes, they can. That's like clearing out the entire milk section at Publix. That's just like the whole thing. <laughs> Suck it up. All right, we got one more, and this one is pretty great. Uh, did you know that moths have uh, stomachs? Moths have stomachs. A little tiny stomach. They just eat it and it goes, a little tiny stomach, and it goes. Is it true or false? And the answer is false. That's not. They do not have stomachs. Can you imagine? Do not eat with a, sl a, a moth. They just eat it and it goes right through them. Mm. Uh, anyway, well, that was our uh, Sunday showdown for today. We hope you enjoyed it. And now it is time for our missions moment. Today in our missions moment, we're going to meet a church in uh, North Carolina that works with people called the Tea People. It's a kind of a, a small group of people that live in Southeast Asia. Um, one of the neat things about missions is that the, the gospel cannot be stopped. And what we're doing now as missionaries and as the church is that we are continuing to take the gospel to places that have never heard it. Last week, we, we saw the Howells who brought Bibles to people and they finally got it in their own language. 
And now, forevermore, these people will be able to have the Bible in their language. One of the hard things, though, is that there's a lot of places in our world that are hard to get to. If you watched our video last week, you saw the Howells that they went, they walked, they went on buses, they also went on a raft across the river. There's a lot of places where it's not easy to get to. Now, almost everywhere here in our country, you can get to, all right? There's a paved road or a dirt road, um, and I can drive in my car, I can take an airplane. However, there's a lot of places in the world where people cannot get to very easily. And so we're going to meet a church that worked hard to raise money to buy a motorcycle to take the gospel to a place that was really hard to get to. Check this out. Let me tell you a story about a church. An ordinary church doing extraordinary things because of an amazing God, the one true God. This church, Old Town Baptist in North Carolina, adopted a people group in Southeast Asia called the Tea People. Many of the Tea People don't know about the one true God or the hope of knowing his son Jesus. The people at Old Town Baptist Church know God wants everyone everywhere to hear this good news. So they travel all the way to Southeast Asia. They work with local Christians telling the Tea People about Jesus. Not all of the tea people live in easy to reach places. Motorcycles can be the easiest and fastest way to get to some villages, and reaching these villages with the gospel takes the same kind of wheels. The kids at Old Town Baptist wanted to help local Christians tell more tea people about Jesus, so they took up a missions offering. And so our children gave uh, about half the cost, about $1,000, uh, toward the cost of that motorcycle. And so our kids were really a big part of uh, helping our two young men get to the places they needed to go to share the gospel. The two men often ride their motorcycle over to a local motorcycle repair shop where a new believer in Jesus works and lives. They teach him from the Bible and help him to learn more about Jesus. On a recent trip, they found that he was even telling others about Jesus, like with one man who used to be a Buddhist leader. Buddhism is a religion many people in Southeast Asia follow. Buddhists don't hear about Jesus and his love for them, so these men invited him to church. He brought me to the church, and then I come to know Jesus as my Savior and eternal God. So, this former Buddhist leader in Southeast Asia got to learn about Jesus because of a motorcycle. That is crazy cool. Ordinary Christians doing extraordinary things because of an amazing God. God uses the prayers and the gifts of Christians to do all kinds of cool things. By giving to your church's global missions offering, you can help support Southern Baptist missionaries all over the world. It provides things like Bibles, tools, and the right wheels to get the job done so that more people groups like the Tea People will hear a good news story. A story about Jesus. The end. Well, the big question we asked at the beginning of our lesson was this. Why did Jesus perform miracles? And the answer is Jesus performed miracles to glorify God, to show he's the Son of God, and to care for people. In today's miracle, we saw that Jesus, when he fed the 5,000 people, not only was he showing he was God, but he also cared for the people by meeting their needs, which shows you the kind of God that he is. He's not just about his great, incredible glory. There's also this, this big desire to really meet the needs of people. And now we want to go over a memory verse for August, and I hope that you'll say it with us. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. Psalm 40. Five. Well, now it's time for our big review.
Hey, thank you so much for joining us. Don't forget, sign up for Kingdom Kids. Sign up for Adventure Crew and join our drive through adventure. Join in the fun. We'll see you guys next week. Love you and miss you. And have a great week. Bye. Please.